and thank you to the festival organizers for inviting us, the Digital Edgeworth Network team, to participate in your festival this year. We're really delighted to be involved. Well, sorry we can't be with you in person, of course. Um, we are the core members of the Digital Edgeworth Network team. Um, uh, Clean O'Gallagher, Ross Ballister, Anna Senku, and I'm Maureen McCarran. Uh, two of us are in Cork, uh, two of us are in Oxford, and um, it's, it's really been a great experience for all of us. I thought we would start today by just asking Clean O'Gallagher, who's the Irish lead, to maybe tell us, tell you a little bit about what the um, what the project entailed, and then maybe to also tell you how she became interested in working on Mariah Edgeworth. So, Clean, over to you. Thanks, thanks a million, Maureen. Um, so the the reason we're all here together as, as a group um, and participating in the festival is that we received funding uh, from the Irish Research Council in Ireland and the Arts and Humanities Research Council in Britain uh, as part of a special uh, programme that they had, which was a networking fund for collaboration in digital humanities. So digital humanities um, is a relatively new development in terms of um, academic research and particularly research in the humanities. And really it's about the application of sort of technology and computer technology to uh, traditional humanities subjects. So. Obviously, um, Edgeworth is a writer on whom there's been kind of uh, a lot of really interesting traditional uh, scholarship, um, particularly from literary critics, but also from, from historians actually in Ireland, uh, particularly. Um, but what we're trying to do is to marry some of that traditional research in literature and history um, with the new techniques uh, of digital humanities. And you're probably still wondering what that means, but Anna will explain because um, she's actually been doing uh, a great deal of the actual on the ground work. Um, but what we've been trying to do is to take a new look at the Edgeworth Correspondence, which is a huge archive. Um, there are very large portions of that archive um, contained in the National Library of Ireland in Dublin, um, and then another even larger portion of that archive in the Bodleian, uh, and Roz can talk a lot about that. Um, uh, and those those were actually split literally almost in half uh, along a chronological divide. Uh, so the person who had the kind of guardianship, the custodian of, of the family archive donated um, a large portion of it to the NLI and another large portion to the Bodleian. And then there's lots of other correspondence in other parts of the world. Um, but what we're trying to do is to give kind of an overall sense uh, of that correspondence. Um, and to show um, what the network is. Um, and again, we're kind of using new techniques to do that. And, um, and Anna will show you some of those results. But for us, what's really exciting about um, what the funding that we were given is that it, it enables us to establish a network. Uh, and this network already partly existed uh, between academic researchers uh, in Ireland and in Oxford and the two libraries. Uh, and then, of course, with the community partners uh, in Edgeworthstown. So what we've been doing this year is partly doing our own academic research, but also really developing and strengthening those links. Um, and it's, as Maureen said, it's it's been a, a kind of a fantastic uh, journey and experience. Um, so I hope that gives you some idea of what we've been up to, but you'll get more of a sense, I think, uh, as we go on. So to your other question, Maureen, uh, how did I get uh, interested in Mariah Edgeworth? Well, it goes all the way back to when I was a lot younger um, in the uh, Anglo-Irish MA seminar room in UCD when I actually, it was the first time I had ever read Edgeworth when I was an MA student. Um, and uh, I won't name the lecturer because it's one of those funny stories, but I'd read the books at home before the class. Um, obviously, I was that kind of student. And I really loved them. And I was completely taken aback because I was like, why did I never read this writer before? She's fantastic. And then I went into the class and the class was so incredibly dull. And I was like, oh my God, there has to be more to Edgeworth than this. And so then uh, from that kind of class, it became, um, uh, my decision was then to do my PhD on Edgeworth. So I researched um, initially under Marilyn Butler, who was really the foundational modern scholar of Edgeworth uh, in Cambridge, uh, and then uh, later on uh, with Nigel Leask, who's now in Glasgow actually, and, and then I published my first uh, book on Edgeworth. And at the time, and I think this is something that might resonate with a lot of people um, in Ireland, at the time, and to a degree still, uh, there was a lot of ambivalence about Edgeworth in Ireland. So within kind of English literary circles, people were retrieving women's writing, women's writing of the Romantic period, all of the women who'd written kind of 
immediately before and were contemporary with Jane Austen were huge at the time. So when I was a graduate student in Cambridge, there was a lot of other really great graduate students um, who were researching women's writing at that period. But in Ireland, there was still this massive ambivalence about Edgeworth uh, because of her class position uh, and the whole kind of uh, settler native divide, you know, to put it very crudely. Um, and one of the things that occurred to me was that um, it was as if nobody had any interest in female experience uh, in the late 18th century. So, you know, to, again, to put it kind of crudely, it was all about the United Irishmen. And particularly when anyone talked about the Enlightenment, it was just about the United Irishmen. And sort of if you hadn't been sworn in as the United Man or you weren't carrying a pike, like nobody was interested <laughs> in your enlightened status. Um, so uh, what I discovered, obviously, was that Edgeworth uh, was, you know, very deeply interested in Enlightenment. And also she was quite interested in the United Irishmen. Uh, so it seemed to me that there was a, a huge perspective um, that was missing from, you know, how people talked about the late 18th century and the early 19th century in Ireland. Uh, and, um, and Edgeworth was just sitting there kind of waiting to be discovered from that point of view. So that was the subject of my PhD and my first book. Um, and so I've kind of been uh, obviously a kind of a fairly passionate ab advocate for Edgeworth uh, ever since. That's brilliant. Thanks, Stina, because I, I think you're right. I, I encountered Edgeworth first in an undergraduate history module. And I remember thinking, why did we never meet her in school? Why, why am I only learning about this, this author now? So I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Um, Raz, how, how, what brought you to um, Edgeworth studies into this project? Oh, one of the links, actually, that uh, as Clina was talking, I, I realised is really important was that I did my doctoral study um, supervised by Marilyn Butler, uh, who wrote this magnificent um, intellectual biography of um, um, Marar Edgeworth um, and had investigated the body and papers very thoroughly for that book. Um, as an undergraduate, I studied Castle Rackrent and was completely baffled by it. I, don't, I think, you know, those I was studying Oxford literature, we were studying English literature, you know, there was nothing, I knew there was something ironic going on there, but not, not much else. <laughs> Um, um, to my shame. Uh, I, can, I, I did my own doctoral research on women writers much earlier and I've always worked on women's writing. In 1995 I edited um, Jane Austen's Sense and Sensibility um, uh, for Penguin Classics, um, which is an absolute joy. Um, and I guess I think I probably came to Edgeworth slightly through Austen, which was there's this famous line in Northanger Abbey when Austen uh, sort of intervenes. Um, uh, there's a young woman reading a novel and she's talking about why do people despise novels? Um, and the young woman is told to put it aside and it, and Austen sort of enters as narrator in outrage and sort of says, she's only reading Cecilia or Camilla or Belinda. Um, Cecilia and Camilla are novels by Francis Burney and Belinda is by Mariah Edgeworth. Um, and these are books that carry, um, how does she put it, the greatest powers of the mind are displayed, the most thorough knowledge of human nature, the happiest delineation of its varieties, the liveliest diffusions of wit and humour. So I thought I'd better go and read Belinda. And I read Belinda and I was completely hooked and have carried on reading the novels. I think the other thing I would say is that teaching Austen a lot, I think one of the things I often want to say to my students or say to my, remind my students is that Austen made uh, just 684 pounds um, from her publication of her novels. Many people have made a lot more money out of her since. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, but Mariah Edgeworth was enormously successful as a novelist. She made, um, we have a, a document which lists, where she lists the literary copyrights from herself and her father, she often wrote with him, um, and they come to 11,062 pounds, eight shillings and 10 pence. When we did an ex exhibition at the body and we put that little, sheet of paper on display that's a huge contrast and I think it's really important to to recognize the kind of um, verbal authority she had in English literature as well as 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 well as in um, uh, with her father in terms of the kind of discourses and, and languages in Ireland and, and for me it became a really important thing I, I could talk about this more but but uh, um, about how the project started but starting around uh, 2016, just after um, the UK had voted to leave Europe, I suddenly got very imaginatively gripped by this story of, a, of an Anglo-Irish family 
um, that was divided across the Irish Sea, a, a, a collection of materials that were divided across the Irish Sea, and a kind of new division that, <laughs> that was opening up after a long history of, of division and work to try and, and, and bring in um, the UK and Ireland into conversation again, but somehow it was being opened up. And I wanted to do something small, admittedly scholarly, but <laughs> kind of spoke to refusing those divisions. That's fantastic. Oh, thank you. And um, Anna, you're the youngest member of the team, so maybe you have a slightly different way, and I don't know, but what, what's brought you to this? Um, so during my uh, undergrad, I took a course called Letters and Literary Form, which was letter writing um, literature on the long 18th century, during the long 18th century. And when it finished, I'd become completely obsessed with the 18th century. And um, somebody I knew had Castle Rack didn't study it didn't but it was in my pile of books of women's writing in the 18th century which is just completely devoured um and that was sort of it for a while because Edgeworth was one of a number of, of writers and then when I um came to do my PhD with Ros as my supervisor on uh, actresses and celebrity culture in the 18th century. I returned to Edgeworth um, and I read Belinda and thinking about the theatricality of her novels um, and returned to letters again because Edgeworth writes this brilliant letter where she describes Sarah Siddons, who's featured in my thesis, most famous actress of the day, as really quite boring. Yes. I thought it was excellent because everything else I'd read had been Siddons being this wonderful, brilliant person. And there's Edgeworth going, ah, she's yes. all right. Um, and that was really refreshing. And so then I started reading more and more of her novels. Um, and after uh, I completed my thesis, um, an opportunity came up, a job opportunity at Oxford to join Ros on the op uh, opening the Edgeworth papers that was what it was called we're now digital Edgeworth network I can't remember um which turned back to letters again so that first introduction to the long 18th century of letters um and so that's kind of it uh, uh, just uh, an interest in people's letter writing their novel writing and she's a sort of amazing figure for that because her writing is so um vast there's so much of it so many different styles um, and I found that interesting the whole way through. I can't quite capture her in the way that some of the other authors of the century are quite easy to pigeonhole, and she's not I don't think that's enduringly interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. So we've talked a little about the project. Is there anything else you'd like to add about how it came about? Roz, you said you might want to say a little bit more about how the project. Yeah, yeah. So um, in 2016, I think it was, a, um, uh, uh, Katrina Cannon, who was deputy keeper of the Bodleian Librarian, wrote to me because I was faculty board chair in English and said, is there anyone in the English faculty who might be interested in Edgeworth? Because we have this amazing manuscript resource that no one seen, people don't seem to be investigating very much. Um, I think it's about 40,000 items. It's not just manuscript correspondence. There's also magnificent, there's a book collection. There's some beautiful engravings and pictures and drawings by the Edgeworth family. Um, and um, I wrote back and said, actually me, I'd like to do that. <laughs> I am really interested in this. And uh, so we had a conversation. I put together an application for a small grant, an internal grant in Oxford to hire some RAs, uh, Anna and um, I had an, another RA called Ben Wilkinson Turnbull um, to help me with promoting the Edgeworth papers. And we did all sorts of things. We, we had a monthly blog, which I loved, we loved doing. It was a sort of uh, timely blog. So we took uh, from uh, February 2019, March 2019 to February 2020, and each month we blogged about a letter that came from the same month, 1819 to 1820. Um, so we were introducing materials and talking about the letters, and of course we were also tracking the uh, endless and painful process of, of Brexit alongside um, those letters. Um, we we said we did an exhibition in November um, in the uh, in a small case in the Bodleian, which attracted about three thousand visitors. We ran a workshop where we invited Cleaner and maybe about seventeen other scholars and librarians and archivists to look at the materials and to think about what we might do with them. And that was the point that we invited um, librarians and archivists from the National Library of Ireland to meet with the scholars we've been working with in the Bodleian. And alongside that, we were also producing um, a digital catalogue 
um, of the correspondence. Um, and that is now available online at the Bodleian. So you can, uh, and you can search some of the, we had some images made of the manuscript. So you can see those as well, and they're not complete. One of the things that we might say about digital humanities, I think is it's a slow and expensive process. <laughs> um, and it requires a lot of work and liaison between different groups with different expertise, you know, um, engineers, technologists, librarians, archivists, scholars, you need all of that to make something that's interesting. Uh, so this was a kind of first sample. That workshop then produced um, a network, and that's the net, the group of scholars and archivists that we're working with now, the NLI and the Bodleian, and we put together a larger grant application, which is funded both by the UK Research Council, the AHRC, and by the Irish Research Council, the uh, um, IRC. So together they, they fund us to do this work. And we work between Cork University and Oxford University. Um, as well so that uh, and we have that funding through until November when the project completes and at the heart of that funding is this investigation of the network of correspondence connected to the Edgeworths. We wanted to show how connected they were across um, Britain and Ireland but also in Europe and actually beyond um, Pakenham Edgeworth has connections to India so there's a kind of global reach to this family um, going back to Cleanest point about a kind of enlightened family who were who wanted to who were who were promoting and thinking about enlightened values in relationship to a network of correspondence local and distant. Great thank you. Cleanest do you want to add anything else to that? Yeah, I think the one thing I, I would say is <clears throat> that there was a really fortuitous kind of um, coming together of different circumstances that led to my involvement in the project. Uh, so firstly, of course, Roz has initi had initiated uh, a project on the Edgeworth Archive in Bodleian, as she's just described. And also in 2018, it was the 250th anniversary of Edgeworth's birth. And there was a number, there were a number of different kind of events and celebrations. And I know that the Edgeworth Society in Longford, for instance, were very closely involved. Um, there was a couple of conferences, I think one in Rome, um, one in Dublin, one in New York. Um, and that sort of reignited my kind of scholarly interest in Edgeworth at the same time that Roz was sort of developing um, this kind of basis for a funding proposal. So um, I was invited to um, write a new critical introduction uh, to Edgeworth by a publisher uh, at the same time. Um, and I found myself kind of returning to Edgeworth uh, at you know quite a few years distance from when I originally did my research. Um, I'm feeling very re-energized re and re-enthused about all the different possibilities and particularly this kind of new kind of focus on um, looking at uh, the, the family as a kind of a network and, and through the archives. Uh, so yeah, it was a really kind of fortuitous kind of uh, set of circumstances. And then of course this funding became available and perhaps in the future more funding might become available, we don't know, but we really hope so. So yeah, that, that's, uh, that's how I got involved. Uh, so yeah, it was great. Brilliant, thank you. So yeah, there's an awful lot going on in a project like this. And as Ross said, I mean, doing digital humanities properly is slow and expensive, but it, that's, it's a long-term investment. That's really the purpose of these things, isn't it? It's part, partly the intention is to, to make resources available outside of the, the, you know, the, the confines of the archive. And that's really an important part of all this and to, to bring people in. Um, so it, in that light, I guess I'd like to ask you all what, what your main hope for what the project might achieve is. So uh, Clean, I might start with you if that's okay. Yeah, so um, for me, one of the really exciting um, uh, uh, emphases and, and outcomes of this uh, project has been the, the closer collaboration uh, with um, <clears throat> the uh, Edgeworth Society and the Mariah Edgeworth Visitor Centre. Um, so the, the funding that this network um, is, is based on um, was kind of uh, emphasized the the value of community community partnership and we were just incredibly fortunate uh, as researchers and also with the libraries that there was such a great community partner in terms of um, the Edgeworth Society and the EDDA uh, in, in Longford um, so they've been doing you know tremendous work uh, for the last number of years and well Matt could tell you it's more than 30 years it's a long time um, and in some ways, we're, we're only kind of catching up with them in terms of broadening access. So uh, we both really have the same goal, 
uh, which is to raise awareness um, of, uh, of the family, um, of the achievements, of their importance in terms of um, cultural heritage, uh, and also then to widen access as well, because obviously when something is in manuscript in an archive, it's very difficult to access. Um, and there's, there's so much more potential, um, we feel, for both uh, the uh, the wider community and also for academic researchers. You know, Roz just mentioned all the very the, the, the varied kind of members of the family, um, the the areas in which they were involved. Um, Edwards is always seen as the center of the network, and and, and she is. Uh, but there are other um, kind of hugely valuable insights that can be gained from the correspondence that um, would, I think, really en enhance the kind of the community appreciation. Um, uh, of the family uh, in Ireland, but also internationally. Yeah. I might run, turn to you now, Ros, <laughs> to see what your, your well, main project is. Well, just, um, well, one, one of them, of course, is that ambition as well to, to, to work um, with the Marara Edward Centre uh, uh, um, and with heritage. Uh, uh, and I, I, I suppose what we often call in academic circles sort of creative engagement with the materials that we're working with so one of the delights of this project has been um, the funding of a, of a creative writing prize uh, for school students to respond to the letters that we transcribed and made available to them um, and and I'm, one of the things I loved about the Opening the Edgeworth project and what we're doing now was that kind of uh, communicating this material in ways that are accessible, but also underpinned, if you like, by, by some pretty deep scholarship and investigation. Um, um, and sharing that and, and getting people's response to it is, is, is so valuable. I suppose, yeah, so that, that's been central. One of the things that will come out of this project is um, what we're calling, um, well, panels that will be installed at the centre, which which demonstrate the network. And we'll talk a bit, Anna can talk a bit more about how that works. So, so there's a kind of uh, scholarly background to this, but we'll also present it in accessible form. And one of the things we did at the exhibition was have a little kind of family tree um, where you could understand better. The Edgeworth was, the exhibition was called Meet the Edgeworth. So you could understand better um, the nature of this um, kinship network. Um, I think fostering collaboration between different libraries is really important actually in a, in a global world. And, and one of the things about accessibility is that virtual, um, sort of making things virtual makes them accessible for people. You don't have to go to a library to visit it. You can, you can share, they can be in a shared space. And they're up for investigation in lots of different ways. I think often as scholars, we kind of package things and say, this is the way to read it. Whereas I'm really excited by the thought that, that making these materials as much available as possible virtually allows people to develop their own interpretive pathways through things rather than us telling them how to read the materials. Brilliant, thank you. And Anna, how about you? Um, I suppose it'll help to understand a little bit of what I've been doing before I answer the question. So the first thing I suppose that I've been doing is taking this, this enormous calendar um, which Colvin, uh, Christina Colvin wrote up detailing all the letters in the NLI and Bodmin collection um, and mining it for key information, you know, who sent the letter, who received it, when did they receive it? Um, and drawing from that lots of information about what uh, Ross says about that global reach. So through all of that data, we can create um, visualizations that um, can make that can make those uh, connections, I suppose, visible to people who are not going to read the correspondence. They're not necessarily going to go to the archives and read the manuscripts, but we can still show that global reach of of that family. So I suppose my hopes for what it will achieve are kind of twofold. The first is um, is that that larger overarching narrative of the network and I think Kayleen you have a um, mm -hmm. some visualization. I do indeed. So the first one is uh, the family tree. So this um, this family tree was um, 
designed for that Meet the Edgeworths um, exhibition that we curated um, a couple of years ago um, to, to help the visitors understand who this family were. And what I would like to do with the data is kind of to reimagine um, this family, not in um, genealogical terms as, as this depicts, um, but as a, as a correspondence, as a network of writers to each other. Um, and if, I, if we show the next image, um, this is the kind of thing that we'll be producing, an image that shows the connections between people. Now, this is um, uh, an image that takes a look at the, the network as a whole, provided that um, the sender or recipient uh, is featured twice, because there are a lot of um, single entries. Um, so these are the key people who are regular correspondents. Um, and this is the kind of thing that we can create um, to show how vast and intricate that network is. You can see that the, the two key people here are, are Mariah Edgeworth and her father, Richard Lovell Edgeworth. They've got these really big circles there, but it's reaching out to all kinds of people. Um, and I'd like to do that both for the family to see who the key writers in that family are um, to each other, but also um, other other writers you can see very small joanna bailey um uh scottish writer so so edward's connections with with other people too um and i hope to be able to explain that and show that to people so they understand really how influential and connected the edwards were thank you and so this project it began in august 2020 so its entire life has, has been conducted under the shadow of the pandemic and, and for one, one consequence of that is the four of us have never actually been in the same room, um, which has, has, been, has been quite sad in some ways, but hasn't held us up. But I thought maybe one or two or all of you would like to speak about how we've had to adapt to the pandemic uh, in, in, in actually running this project, because it was obviously devised in 2019, early 2020, at a time when nobody could have imagined what was, what was about to befall us. Yeah, I think that obviously, as you said, one of the the kind of the downsides is that uh, we haven't been able to meet all of us together in person, and also that the um, the British participants haven't had a chance during this the period of the project to come to Ireland. I was really fortunate in August in that there were the restrictions then allowed me to to travel to to Longford to Edwardstown and and to meet Matt and to take a tour of the centre and all the different sites, uh, which was fantastic. And I would really really hope. Um, that, that the other participants would, would have that experience too. Um, and, and that we will be able to attend another Edgeworth Festival in, in person, because I know that the centre is, is now at last open again, which is great. Um, although I do, on the other hand, I would say that we've had more frequent meetings, I think, as a team, because we've been able to use online technology and we've become really familiar with, with meeting together in exactly this way. Um, and in some ways, you can see the upsides that will go, I think, go forward into the future with international collaboration, which is great. You know, so uh, yeah, borders may divide us, <laughs> but uh, the technology certainly has allowed us to maintain a, a really kind of constant collaboration, um, which um, has been valuable. So I, how does anyone else feel about the, the pandemic? Yeah, this is one of the things I was thinking was, um, you would think that the issue would be about not being with people. Um, and that is a, a, a problem. Um, but I suppose one could also sort of say, well, we're working with the correspondence network and that's the premise that underpins a correspondence network. You know, when you can't be with someone, you write to them, you know, and you bridge that divide by writing to them. And that's clearly what the family was doing. Um, and our virtual means of communication do allow that. Uh, the, I did think, I do think the most difficult thing has been not being able from from our point of view in the UK is not being able to go to the NLI mm. in person and there is something I think for literary scholars and people who work with text about just like being in a family you need to kind of live with papers and be with them and their virtual substitute the surrogates that you get um, are harder to sift they're harder to work with they seem rather isolated doing the kind of work that we've been doing with the um uh, visualizing the networks and, and we do promise that we will not be putting up panels at the Mariah Edgeworth Centre that are as complex and spider-like as the last <laughs> one we, see. we will translate them into under you know navigable and attractive forms of understanding um, but 
yeah, so it's that that experience of being with papers, which we had at the Bodleian and made it so precious, sitting with those files. One of the things we haven't mentioned um, is, is that not only are they divided chronologically, but they're divided in the way they're organized between the Bodleian and the NLI. So at the Bodleian, they're organized according to correspondent files, according to who's being written to. And in the NLI, they're organized according to date. So bringing them together virtually will allow you to search by either means and allow you to work with them in different ways. But that's also something that we're trying to overcome because it makes a huge difference to the way that you um, understand the materials, whether you're looking at what someone wrote to one person, what Mariah wrote to Francis, uh, her sister, or to, or to Francis, her stepmother, or what she wrote in sequence to lots of different correspondents, or what she said differently to three different correspondents in one day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, so all of yeah. yeah. Yeah, fascinating. Yeah. I, I think for me it's it's kept me weirdly focused as well. Um when we were working on the Edgeworth exhibition, um, we were we read something one day about you know the, the clothes that they took to Paris. Um, and so I went off to the Bodleian and then spent several hours looking at fashion plates from 1819. <laughs> um and so whilst it's been really sad and I was really looking forward to going to um, to the NLI, um, I also know that I could waste several hours on tangents in the archive and my key task has been um, making sure that the calendar is, uh, the data is mined and we, we take the right data from that and it really focused the mind. I couldn't just ask NLI uh, archivists to um, take images of everything for me. So I've had to be really specific. And that's been really useful for us. We've been able to find out things that are, are rather opaque about the calendar. Seven letters, just called children's letters, for example. And we've been able to find that and be really, really specific. And I think that's been very useful because as soon as I can go to the NLI, I'll just be sitting there for a very long time. Yes. And I'm not sure that any outcomes <laughs> will be quick. So, so that's been really good. Yeah, there's a lovely reading room as well in the National oh. Library. It's really, really special reading room, so you'll love it when you get to go there. Yeah. Um, well, that's brilliant. Thank I thought I'll just wrap up by maybe asking you all to just um, think, you know, maybe comment on something that you maybe you learned about the Edgeworth family since starting this project, or perhaps what was your, what for you has been the best part about the project so far? So I thought, Anna, I might start with you this time. Um, well, firstly, I really love working in this team. It's been a really nice um, way to work and to uh, everyone with slightly different specialisms, specialisms and coming to the Edgeworth in a different way. So that's been extraordinary um, and great for my, my career and, and learning. The second thing would be, perhaps because we did this in pandemic times, um, it has changed my view of, of the correspondence. A, a little like Ross said about you need distance and separation. But I remember that when we were in the first, the first project, we would laugh often at the regular repeated letters about members of the family with poor health. We're like, oh no, can't they say something else? Can't they say something more interesting? Um, and I have a greater appreciation for now being separated from people and wanting to know about their health and how they are. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, this is data and this is a network and it's it's all kind of interesting things and they've got connections to philosophers and thinkers and writers but they're also a family and I have a greater appreciation for that from doing this work. Rose, how about you? Probably similar thing around how fascinating it is to explore a family and, and, and what an extraordinary family they are. They're funny and they're curious and they're intelligent one thing that's really come out for us, I think, and that we want to carry on developing is looking at how engaged and active the children in this family were with the Enlightenment projects, with experimentation. One of the lovely things that happened in, um, in the course of this was that the body and bought some new papers, so, um, Mariah Edgeworth's correspondence with the, um, a physician called Holland. Um, and we were transcribing one lovely letter which describes Pakenham um, it's only seven and he's really excited because they have a skeleton of a mole brought to their kitchen table to their breakfast table um, and he recognizes it's a mole and nobody else does 
And she has this lovely line when she says, what a triumph, how the colour rose in his little plump cheeks. And it's a competitive, it's a sort of competitive family where they're all trying to prove how much they know. And it's made us, uh, um, and they're playing games with each other. So one of the things I love about it is, is recognising as a literary historian and as um, how important children's knowledge uh, and agency is in families that we tend to, one of the things we, I think we have got very clear about now is that we tended to sort of view this family as having quite a sort of top down authority structure from Robert Lovell Edgeworth to Mariah and Dan. And actually we see lots of evidence of all the kind of bottom up activity. <laughs> quite literally, Packenham has this lovely love, another letter where Packenham is um, bumped on the back by on his bottom by a sheep and is outraged you know <laughs> so all of those stories have been wonderful to read and show you just how important and active children are in making um, these extended networks. Thank you. Can I give the final word to you? Well yes I have a big confession to make here which is that when I was researching Edgeworth first and you know doing my PhD and writing that book um, I could never get the family straight at all so <laughs> they were, they were <laughs> They are such a huge family, as you can see from that that um, family tree that we showed. And I was just endlessly confused. Um, and so I was focused primarily on Mariah and her writings. And I am absolutely delighted to say that I now actually understand the Edgeworth family. And it actually has changed um, a little bit the way I approach my work, even when it comes to looking at Edgeworth's own writing, because I was writing the last chapter of this book, you know, this, this critical introduction, and Edgeworth's last novel, Helen, was published in 1834. And famously, there's this huge hiatus between uh, Ormond in 1817, um, which is written the year her father died, and then this really big gap where she wrote no fiction for adults, and then she produces Helen in 1834. And obviously, what you're doing then is you're dealing with somebody who's at a very different stage of their life. Um, and one of the things that um, would be pointed out is that because her father died, she then actually became the head of the family, sort of, particularly when it came to her sisters. Um, and that actually seems to feed its way into Helen as a novel, which is very, very female centred, because not all of Edgeworth's novels actually are. Um, she would be called an Enlightenment feminist, but her books often have um, primarily uh, primary male characters. Um, but Helen is very, very feminocentric. Um, and one of the things I realized was that letter that we chose, one of the letters we chose for the creative writing competition uh, is a classic example of Edward's new role at the later stage of her life. You know, she was traveling to England. She saw herself as responsible for Fanny and Fanny was going through this major kind of crisis about whether or not she should accept this marriage proposal. And we thought it was a great letter and we got fantastic responses to that letter in the creative writing competition. But when I was rereading the letter and thinking about Edgeworth at that stage of her life, I was re realizing, you know, just how changed her life was, that she was taking such responsibility uh, for the family, for her sisters. Um, and that, and you know, we've been talking a lot here about what we learned about family, you know, just how seriously she took those responsibilities. So it's been a huge education for me, really, in understanding the whole family uh, and also kind of seeing how that might then kind of change uh, the view you might have of, of some of her writing as well. Right. Well, thank you all very much. This has been a really interesting conversation. And uh, thank you again to the festival organisers for including us in this year's festival. And thank you very much, Maureen, for being uh, a, a great question master and, <laughs> and wrangling us, I hope. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone.